The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. All right. Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to our last uh, DIS2 lecture. Today, we're going to wrap things up um, by completing the overview of prototyping techniques. Um, that's been a topic for the last couple of lectures now. Uh, and today we're going to look at hardware prototyping in particular. So um, today's class is going to contain a bit of uh, an overview of um, the key elements of prototyping hardware software um, systems. And um, we're also going to include a tiny little hands-on crash course um, towards the latter part of the class for you guys to get a bit of uh, hands-on experience with one of the prototyping tools that are at your disposal. OK, so without much ado, um, the key reason why we're doing this is that uh, things changed quite drastically from you know the 90s, essentially, to what we're looking at today. Um, in the 90s, uh, if I spoke to people about doing a user interface, uh, this was what we were, we were all thinking about, right? This is what we had in our minds. Um, it's a desktop. It was essentially about pushing around pixels on a screen in the end uh, and designing the whole user experience around that experience, around that very clearly defined um, environment, use case, and input-output techniques, right? A mouse, a keyboard, a screen, um, a speaker, and that was pretty much it. Now, from there, we got through the mobile uh, phase, we got on the web, we got handhelds, we got smartphones, we got smartwatches, uh, and today, um, interfaces are everywhere, right? Um, I mean, user interfaces are in your uh, washer-dryer combination, and they are in your uh, home thermostat, and they are uh, looking back at you from your wristwatch, um, even you know embedded in clothing sometimes. So essentially, we're seeing so many things being infused with digital technology, obviously, uh, that Every time that happens, this usually also means that you need to add some kind of UI to it. Um, and because of this plethora and multitude of form factors and shapes and physical appearances of these devices that are much more varied than you know, the desktop screen of, of the 90s, um, we have to, if we, if we take user interface design seriously, even as computer scientists, we have to take the physical form factor into account. You cannot ignore the fact that your UI is running on a particular device that has a particular shape, has a particular pattern of use, of physical use, where people keep it, where they, how they hold it, uh, how they engage with it. And that's just fundamentally different from whether you're looking at your wristwatch or whether you're interacting with a wall-sized touchscreen display, for example. So this is why we deal in the computer science class here uh, why we deal with hardware prototyping, right? to make sure that we can build prototypes that have enough fidelity on the hardware side, being close enough to the real thing on the hardware side as well as the software side, um, in order to get a realistic feedback from your user studies, your, um, you know, your interviews, your, your research. So um, the topics today are going to be about these three fundamental parts that make up a UI for a modern embedded um, you know, computing device. And, and that is, first of all, the form. So that's the mechanics, right? That's the shape of the device um, that you could, you know, that doesn't require any electronics or gadgetry. It's just a mechanical um, appearance of the thing that you are designing. On the other end of this is its function. Right, so you know the old um, saying, form follows function in a good design. You know, you think about how something is supposed to work first, and then you shape it accordingly. That's been um, a mantra of industrial designers for, for many generations. So um, and when, whenever function follows form, then you're looking at something that, you know, put aesthetics first and, and you know, put usability second and usually um, fails um, with users because they don't, you know, they don't really have a good user experience with it. Anyway, so form and function are the two things. And function, how is that expressed? 
Well, in modern devices, uh, it's increasingly code, right? Um, used to be that simple household appliances would have, you know, just some, I don't know, electronics in there, uh, analog electronics and nothing else. But these days, most everything has a microcontroller that is running the show, right? That is making sense of anything that, you know, people are doing to the device and the input they're doing um, and, and driving any outputs that it's supposed to drive, whether it's your alarm clock or, or your wristwatch or, um, you know, anything that has a computer built in of some source. Um, but of course, in between, we have um, still the need to have our code influence the physical world around it, right? To, um, to both sense what's going on and to influence that environment and to create output. So these are the input and output devices. So far, when we've looked at uh, we've looked at software user interfaces, um, those um, sensors, if you like, were buttons, right? And and input widgets, right? Bit widgets that could detect text input, and they were all being, you know, manipulated with this one input or two input devices of let's say mouse and keyboard or maybe your fingers on a touch screen. So now we're looking at a multitude of different sensors um, that could pick up something, whether it's the you know the the ambient um, lighting level or whether it's noise or uh, whether it's the uh, it's the the air pressure or whatever it might be, um, these things get picked up. So that's the sensors. This is your your way to get data from the environment into your code essentially. And then of course you've got actuators on the other end, right? Your good old LED that we're seeing here. Uh, but also, of course, displays of all sorts, um, both visual, but also auditory, for example, you know, playing something back on a speaker um, or moving things around physically, right? Um, for example, for some kind of haptic interface or to actually fulfill the function that something has. Take, a, take your home you know, vacuum robot, right? That thing has actuators um, to actually move around and, and do the cleaning, right? To do its job. So... These three parts, form, function, and, and the sensors and actuators in between, each fall into a particular kind of prototyping task as well. Right? You need to prototype the form, you need to prototype the function, and you need to prototype the sensors and actuators in between. Right? Um, and we're going to take a brief look at each of these three areas. Uh, let's start with form. How do you prototype form? Well, that gets us into the area of mechanics. Right? In the back here, you see some um, you know, simple uh, cutouts, you know, non-functional models of an iPhone, an iPad, and a, and a, and a MacBook um, to illustrate, you know, you can have these things without them doing anything, right? So we do the mechanical uh, part, we do the form prototyping um, because of the reality that we live in that is, you know, getting closer and closer to the vision of ubiquitous computing that you all know from, from DIS1, right? The fact that computers have entered um, devices um, around us and have permeated everyday life, as we like to say. Um, and so we need to do hardware prototype. We need to figure out the form factor. Um, and I want to reiterate this uh, little wonderful story of the, the guy who invented the, uh, the, the company that invented the Palm Pilot, the guy who, who ran the company, made his staff, um, his design team, run around with little uh, boxes of, you know, little blocks of wood in their pockets for uh, for months at a time, um, just to determine how big such a device could possibly be in order to not be annoying for people. Right? So he said, no matter what it does, no matter how magical its function is, what is the size that you would tolerate to carry around with you at all times? And that's how they arrived at the size of the Palm Pilot. Um, and hardware prototyping has been something that we've talked about already um, in DIS1, right? This mechanical prototyping of the form. Uh, here you can see a nice example of, of a cardboard prototype with a, uh, with a glued on uh, screenshot um, of an interface. Um, but these things can get uh, a little more involved, right? Here, for example, we have foam core, um, a very nice uh, uh, material to do prototyping with because you could cut it easily with a knife. Uh, but it has a nice finished surface as well. Um, and we can see how somebody took foam core, made a box for a device out of it, and then actually started putting electronics um, into that 
um, you know, container and even a display here and some buttons um, to get to a uh, working physical prototype. So this thing already shows, if you want, not just the foam core, but also shows the electronics part, the sensors, actuators part. And obviously there's some code running um, somewhere there behind the scenes too. So it's showing the three parts of the device design. Here's another one that comes uh, without any um, interactivity, without any electronics or, or smartness. Um, it's a cardboard prototype, right? Showing um, a, um, you know, I think this was a was a design of a toaster that was supposed to, um, you know, toast pictures onto your breakfast toast for your entertainment, right? So you could put little uh, graphics onto your toast while you made it. And you can see here how the, um, the group prototyped this just with cardboard, uh, maybe even a moving, you know, lever here that moves up and down, possibly gets the toast ejected if you're, if you're that fancy. But, you know, it gave people a way to, to have the hardware um, aspect of it represented. And this is kind of where we stopped with hardware prototyping in DIS1, right? We said, while you're paper prototyping, maybe make a physical rough sketch of your interface, right? Build something from cardboard, foam core, um, something like that. Maybe plywood if you get really fancy. Um, but we were down to essentially manual techniques to do this. Now, how do you move up in fidelity from the cardboard prototyping? Uh, it's easy enough, right? We've got modern manufacturing techniques that used to be available only to large-scale you know, mechanical engineering corporations that were producing goods for a living. But nowadays, um, you get access to this kind of stuff at your local fab lab, right? Um, people can afford 3D printers and, and lathes and those kinds of things to, um, to make physical prototypes. Right? So here are some, some um, classical tools. On the left, we see a CNC mill. Right? This is a mill that takes a block of aluminum, for example, and then just uh, drills away anything that you don't want um, in a uh, fairly evolved and, and, and fairly tricky technical process that needs a lot of hand-holding and needs somebody very experienced to run it. Um, and then you are left with whatever you, know, you, um, you need it. Um, we also have laser cutters, right? Laser cutters that essentially take material um, and cut it simply, um, you know, flat material, flat sheet material, and cut it in 2D in arbitrary shapes very fast, very effectively. Um, and, and laser cutting is actually an incredibly um, affordable and accessible way to build prototypes, much more so than CNC milling, because CNC milling requires a lot of trickery, uh, mechanical um, constraint thinking. For example, uh, you know, a CNC milling head cannot go everywhere you want it to go uh, because it has a certain size, right? So it cannot do arbitrary cutouts, for example, um, simply because of the size that it is um, and, and the fact that it cannot access the material from all sides. Uh, whereas if you're down to um, sheet material, flat material, and you've got a laser cutter that has hardly any, any width of the tool itself, it's like way below a millimeter, um, you can do pretty much anything as long as it is in, in 2D with a laser cutter. Um, both of these um, have something in common though. Uh, they are both subtractive manufacturing techniques, meaning you start with a block of material and then you subtract from it, right? You take away from it to get to the thing that you want. Um, you get uh, easy access to um, a laser cutter, for example, in our fab lab, uh, that we have at the chair at the university. Um, and um, we also have some mills, although we don't mill metals, we typically uh, leave it at milling foam core or some softer materials just for uh, shape prototyping. Um, but let's look at the other side, of course, and that's been all the rage these last 10 years then, uh, 3D printing, right? So 3D printing is an additive manufacturing technique because you are adding material over time to build the thing that you want. and um, the, uh, you know, the simplest approach here that we see here in the Ultimaker, as I'm sure you're aware, is essentially like a glorified heat gun, right? Uh, klebe Pistole in German. Uh, so it's essentially moving around and it's exerting oodles of plastic onto a surface. And as they come out, they cool and, and settle. And these strings of plastic are being placed um, layer by layer. And that way you build up a whole 3D object. Um, 
So the the nice thing about these kinds of devices is that um, that three D printing is actually much more beginner accessible because there is much less you need to think about mechanically speaking. Um, you can basically make eh, more or less any three D model in a in a modeling tool and then throw it at a three D printer. And if it's a good three D printer that has support materials, um, it will essentially make that thing for you and and you can uh, you know pick it out of the uh, printer a couple hours later. Um, so these are two techniques, um, you know, additive and, and subtractive digital manufacturing that will give you much higher fidelity uh, in your prototyping, in the form prototyping, right? So if you want to move beyond cardboard, you want to get a better quality uh, hardware prototype, form for prototype, uh, then 3D printing or, or laser cutting or uh, milling are your, are your friends, right? Um, materials are a little limited that way. I mean, laser cutting only works with stuff that you know, will, uh, you know, will be able to be cut by the laser that you have. Um, usually, uh, this is plywood or uh, or cardboard. Uh, in most cases, I mean, there's also metal laser cutters, but those are a little bit more, uh, you know, less less frequently available to you. Three um, D printing, on the other hand. Um, uh, supports plastics, a whole variety of plastics. And of course, it's not just this technique of, of 3D printing. There's others out there that will um, handle elastic materials. Um, there are ways to print things that behave a little bit like wood that can be shaped like wood and be, can be filed down after you printed it. Um, so there's also printers that will create metal um, uh, printer uh, prints. But again, the more exotic you get with your materials, uh, the harder it will become to find a quick and affordable way to do the prototype. And oftentimes you don't need the, the material to be the final material of the thing that you're making. You just want the shape to be there, right? Uh, so plastics are oftentimes good enough. Um, another way to, uh, to create uh, prototypes from, from other materials um, is molding and casting. So that means that you have a mold, a, a, a form in which you pour some liquid, uh, typically some kind of resin or silicone, um, and then you let that settle and then you remove the mold and you're left with the cast that has the shape of the thing that you want. So here you see an example of uh, some of our own research where we built some um, flexible um, pneumatic robot um, actuators. So these were little um, blocks that you could uh, pump air into, and then they would basically inflate and change shape in, in ways that you could influence by the way that you shaped this actuator. Uh, and as you can see here, in this case, we 3D printed the molds uh, with plastic that was um, able to serve as a mold, and then we poured the silicone into it and created the actual cast from that. So this is a, a nice approach to get a much wider range of materials under your belt if you need to prototype something. So uh, in this case, you would do a CAD design, then 3D print the molds, and then cast your actual thing that you want using those molds. And you know, maybe you can use the molds a couple of times. Maybe there are one-off molds that you need to break in order to get the cast out. That depends on your design. So we're not going to get into more about um, mechanical design. Um, if, if you're interested in this, we have some um, materials that we have, for example, we recently wrote a little booklet um, that's kind of like a primer to 3D printing. Um, and um, we'll share the, uh, the URL to that later. It's available as a free of charge um, PDF that you can take a look at that explains 3D printing and its, its basic options that you have as a, as a hobbyist um, without access to you know, like industrial strength machines. Um, but if we, if we look beyond the uh, the form next up is the function and function of course um, you might say well that's we've covered that right we've we've talked about building interfaces in code uh, but remember that all the interfaces we've talked about so far um, were mostly designed to run on a screen and then we had a little bit of a look at you know haptic and audio interfaces as as a way departing from that and here. Um, I'm talking about interfaces that run on a hardware prototype that may have a display. It probably has a display. Most 
elect in, in, interactive devices have a display these days. I mean, even your toothbrush, toothbrush has a display these days. Um, but they also have other ways of, you know, input and output. Um, so this is the the topic of embedded programming, right? So embedded programming and and electronics um, is the way in order to add function to hardware prototypes. And here we see an example of an embedded board on the left uh, that is connected to a display here in the middle and some breadboard uh, here on the right, right? So this is um, a typical example of a uh, hacked together prototype. Now, as you can see here, uh, no attention was being paid to putting this into a proper casing so that it would resemble an actual product, right? Um, if this was a home controller, then um, it's not a home controller you would want to get anywhere near, right? Because obviously all those wires are going to fly off the moment you touch it. But it, it shows that here we have the electronics working and the embedded code running on the left here on a little microcontroller board. So um, doing embedded programming in electronics um, is a typical topic for adding function to hardware prototypes, right? Um, so with this, what you can do is essentially link the world of your, or, or infuse the, um, the mechanical prototype that you have, which is just a dumb piece of plastic or something, right? To infuse it with, with life, right? To give it a soul, to be a little bit dramatic here, to actually make it do something rather than just having to, to play make-believe with, you know, paper and cardboard buttons and displays uh, that you scribbled on there yourself. So this is the way that you make your, your um, prototypes interactive. And um, for that, we're going to take a look at the um, um, at, at some examples of boards that do this. Um, and the first one I want to uh, uh, mention here is the one that's probably most well known and that we will take a closer look at later, uh, which is the, the Arduino board. Um, this is an example of a board that uses um, an embedded microcontroller. And a microcontroller is essentially a CPU, uh, as you know it from desktop computers, but it has a few things built in. Um, it has memory built in, uh, RAM. It has even some flash memory built in, so it can store a program and hold on to it. Um, and it has um, I.O. Um, buses built in, so it has I.O. connectors built in so that it can actually control and sends voltages on its pins directly, um, analog ones or, or digital ones uh, that just go high-low. And so this is uh, the heart of any um, embedded program platform is this microcontroller. And here in the Arduino Uno, we have an Atmega um, in here. The, uh, the Arduino project started in 2003. So it's, it's you know, almost 20 this, uh, now. Um, and it started actually as a master thesis project um, at, a, uh, at the Interaction Design Institute at uh, Ivrea in Italy. Um, and, uh, you know, from there on, it, it took the world by storm, I would say, uh, mostly because it was designed uh, with teaching electronics and teaching embedded programming um, in mind. So it wasn't designed by engineers for engineers, but it was actually designed by people who were designers and educators themselves, and that it made carefully made sure that it was uh, an easily accessible tool. Um, the, uh, you know, the Arduino, we're going to take a look at um, um, a little later. But um, for now, you know, what you typically get on a board here is input output pins, right? These are the two rows that you see here at the top. Um, and they typically um, give you digital IO. So you can basically set the, out, um, the outgoing uh, connectors here to zero volts or to five volts, um, which is typically the operating system, uh, operating voltage of, of, of these boards. Nowadays, many of these come with 3.3 volts as of uh, operating voltage, but whatever it is, you know, your digital pins will go all on or all off. Um, and they can, you know, they, they give you enough power to drive, um, you know, an LED or two, for example, um, or to um, control smaller devices. If you want to, you know, control big things with this, like, you know, whole lighting installations, then of course you need to add some more electronics to, to the board. Um, the, uh, the, the way to control um, analog voltages here is done uh, using pulse width modulation. We'll talk about that later when we do the 
um, actual hands-on um, crash course. Uh, but what's important to understand is that these embedded systems are usually connected to your computer somehow, right? Because you don't want to program on this thing, right? There's no display. Um, you know, it's hard to connect a keyboard to it. Um, so you typically hook them up to a computer using USB or maybe using a wireless connection like Bluetooth. Um, and then you basically, you know, run your IDE um, on your computer and write your code and upload it to the device, which means that you flash it onto this um, embedded controller. And then the code is on the controller and, you know, the thing can run from there and it can disconnect from the computer. But that's why you need the uh, connection here for both USB to connect to your computer and also to power it. Alternatively, the uh, the Uno can also be powered by a uh, like a nine volt block plus or minus a few volts. Um, and uh, the last part that we see down here are analog inputs. So this is where you can detect not just whether a switch is closed or open, but also whether a voltage is changing uh, gradually. For example, from a temperature, uh, an analog temperature sensor or force sensor, for example. Um, so we'll see uh, we'll see more about this uh, uh, later on. The program, you know, the key advances of the Arduino environment were that it made embedded programming incredibly easy. Um, I like uh, I like the measurement. At one point, I saw this in some review, and I thought it was just the the greatest uh, measurement anybody ever invented. It was MTTP, which meant mean time to blink. That's the amount of minutes it takes you from unpacking the device to actually getting it hooked up to computer and programming it with some code that makes an LED blink, right? Which is sort of like the hello world in the embedded uh, programming world. And you know, the the mean time to to blink. To this, to running this blink code on the device from when you first get it and and connect it to your computer and and learn it, um, is really really low. Right? We'll see this when we when we do the hands on uh, demo later on. Um, the other thing that is uh, a key advance that the Arduino created was that because it was so successful as a platform, it created a huge online community. So today, if you have a problem that you want to sense anything, uh, let's say you want to sense um, soil humidity, right, for water plants. The best way to Google that is literally to put in, you know, soil humidity and, and the word Arduino, because then something will pop up and you'll probably see a YouTube video from some 12 year old kid that will explain to you how to connect your soil humidity sensor to your Arduino, how to program it and how to make it work to, to monitor your plants. Um, so that's how it, it, it essentially built up such a huge online community that um, nowadays more and more systems are just adding Arduino compatibility to their, to their designs, even if their boards are doing other things. Um, it's basically become almost a, a, a de facto standard uh, in the maker and, and embedded uh, programming world of people doing these kinds of projects. But there isn't just the Arduino Uno that you just saw. Um, over the years, the Arduino also created a whole bunch of different um, form factors. Uh, one that I think, you know, we're showing a few here on the right-hand side so that you get a sense. The Arduino Lily Pad, for example, was designed, you know, it's got a variant of that same controller on there. So you can program it with the same IDE, with the same basic language. Um, one or two things are slightly different, but they are very easy to, to understand. And then you can sew this to clothing or to textiles um, because the pins are laid out in this circular uh, fashion with the holes in there that are designed to be stitched through. And they are big enough to um, connect to with a soldering iron directly um, or to uh, put conductive thread through and just sew this thing with conductive thread to your textile and you have an electric connection. Not the greatest electric connection, but you have a connection. Um, so this was um, um, a great success designed by somebody, uh, Leah Buckley, who was at MIT at the time. Um, and this was designed specifically to support wearable computing projects. On the other hand, you have the Nano, uh, which is about you know the size of a postage stamp, roughly. Um, so very small, much smaller than the original Uno, which is more like, uh, well, you know, the size of a credit card. Um, and so these things are used whenever space is at a premium, right? When you're trying to get your design into a small form factor, when the thing you're designing has, has serious space constraints and you use one of those smaller versions of the Arduino. Again, they run mostly with the exact same code. And if you write your code in the Arduino language, uh, then you can usually just change the board that you'd want to send it to, change the board type in your IDE and, uh, and you're ready to go. Um, 
But you might say, what about communication, right? We haven't talked about how, how these things talk to the world, right? Where's the, where's the internet connectivity? Where's the, uh, where's the web browser? Where's the uh, TCP IP connectivity? Well, um, that is something that has been added more recently. Um, I mean, there's, there have always been uh, uh, boards to add, for example, Wi-Fi connectivity to a standard UNO just by uh, stacking them on top. Um, and and basically extending the board with a with a so-called shield. But these days, um, Bluetooth uh, or or Wi-Fi is something that you can put onto the main board um, because stuff has gotten small enough to do that. And this is the currently modern shape of Arduino boards um, that have advanced capabilities. So, for example, the the Arduino Maker Maker is an example of a of a board that has both much more processing power than the original Arduino the Arduinos have, but also has things like uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth um, on board. All right. Um, so when you um, move beyond the Arduino, I just want to show you a few more of these embedded prototyping platforms to give you a sense for what you could use as tools uh, when you have to do a job like that. Um, so going with something from the Arduino family is not a bad choice because a lot of the problems that you run into will have been solved on the internet and you can find them really easily. Um, and it's an easy to learn platform as you'll see in a minute. But to show you some other ideas, right? And again, I'm doing the usual thing here in DIS2. I show you these uh, to give you the patterns behind them, right? The, the key ideas. So for example, uh, the, uh, while the Arduino just tried to be a very easily learnable tool um, with an easily understandable language so that non-computer scientists could could program with it. I mean, it was literally designed uh, with design students in mind, not computer science students, right? Uh, the BBC Microbit took a bit of a different approach. It was basically uh, created as part of a national initiative of the UK through the BBC um, to give their kids, a whole generation of kids, um, their own embedded computer. And so this thing uh, was basically given away for free to every uh, you know child uh, between the age of 11 and 12, uh, which was like class seven, I think, uh, in Britain, uh, starting in 2016. Right. So there you have around like a million devices just in instantly. You have an instant user base that's massive, and it's all around education, of course. Right. Um, the BBC Microbit also is unique in that it has not just one way to be programmed, but it has a whole bunch of different programming environments. Uh, you can program it in JavaScript, you can program it in Scratch, a, a plug and play language where you connect blocks of, of code together, uh, or you can program it in Python, so pretty modern language. Um, Microsoft was actually involved in designing the programming environment for the, uh, the Microbit, um, and it's a and, and the connector down there is, is also pretty ingenious. You've got these big connectors, these big five connectors that you can use with, you know, um, these simple, uh, you know, uh, alligator clips, right? You know, Coco clem. Um, so that's suitable for, for smaller, you know, for, for young kids to, to do simple uh, in-class experiments. But then you've got these smaller connectors in between. So if you want to connect this to a... Um, um, if you need more connections, if you need more uh, more pins, then you can connect to these smaller pins in between, uh, you know, with a with a more fine grained grid. Now, of course, the other success story in this space is um, this, right? Um, the Raspberry Pi uh, appeared in 2012, uh, so um, about 10 years after the Arduino. Uh, but it also had an entirely different approach. While the where the Arduino is really an built around an embedded microcontroller only, right? The Arduino is running on a, is using a microcontroller as at its heart that is very similar to what you would put into a washing machine, for example, right? A simple embedded device. Most importantly, it doesn't have an operating system. The Arduino does not have an OS. There's nothing running all the time when you turn this thing on, right? There's no operating system running into which you then launch your applications. On the Arduino, 
you upload the code and that code gets executed line by line when the thing powers up. Very different to from the approach of the Raspberry Pi because the Raspberry Pi is essentially a computer, right? So it's not an embedded microcontroller board, it's a single board computer, right? So you have a regular CPU on there, um, you've got a networking stack, you've got an operating system running, Linux in this case, um, and uh, so it's, it's much more powerful when it comes down to being able to uh, you know, run, for example, standard code that runs on Unix-based operating systems, right? You can you know, run, run um, you know, Emacs on this thing if you connect a keyboard and, and display. And as you can see, there are HDMI connectors to connect actual displays. There's USB-C connectors. Um, so you know, there's lots of connectors for standard computer components, right? USB in various forms, even an Ethernet connector. So uh, Raspberry Pis are really very small PCs in a way, right, that run Linux. So that's fundamentally different from the Arduino. And a lot of people miss that difference. Um, but it's important that we understand it uh, because the Raspberry Pi makes some things much easier, like talking to the network or running a server, for example, that others connect to, um, or running standard Unix-based um, tools and packages on it. On the other hand, you have an OS. So all of a sudden, you have all the complexity of an operating system along with potential viruses, along with potential updates that need to be done with the OS. You need to maybe update your OS to make it secure when you connect it to the net, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of things um, that are happening on this system, it's much more complex to, to get your first piece of code going. And it was not designed as something you know super easy to pick up. And the meantime to blink with this is not five minutes. Right? In fact, connecting sensors and actuators to it is not quite straightforward. There is this um, GPIO um, um, header uh, row back there at the at the top, um, but it's less obvious how to talk to it than it is with the Arduino. That's all purpose built for that uh, for that um, unique uh, task. So, if all you need to do is you know turn on a bunch of LEDs and sense a couple of sensors, uh, analog ones or digital ones, by all means, please stay away. Don't, don't use an operating system, right? Keep, keep with the Arduino and its simplicity. That's why these things are built so simple because they need to run in embedded devices for years without crashing, right? Without anybody having access to a debugging um, you know, console or anything like that. Whereas if you need a, a full-blown computer in your, in your project, built in, then you know the Raspberry Pi is, is a good choice. It's a better choice. Um, to give you an idea of uh, where things are now going, um, we have uh, stuff like the Arduino BLE 33, the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense, terrible name. Uh, but what it's trying to say is it's still about postage stamp sized, but thanks to miniaturization, uh, this thing actually has not just a microcontroller on board, uh, but it also has a whole bunch of sensors on board. So there is an inertial sensor. So you can sense basically rotation around uh, uh, all three axes. And um, it has gyro and mag magnetometer and accelerometer built in. So people call these a nine degree of freedom um, uh, sensors, usually nine, nine DOF. Uh, it has humidity and temperature sensors. It has a barometric sensor, so it can sense the air pressure. It has a microphone built in, so you can run uh, things like voice, simple voice recognition on it. It can sense mid-air hand or swipe directions on three axes uh, using a gesture sensor. Uh, it has a light sensor for color and uh, light intensity. Um, and all these sensors are, of course, um, you know, they, they need some more um, processing power too. So what this thing has on board as well is... Uh, you know, a way to execute neural networks that have been created uh, with uh, with a version of TensorFlow, Google's uh, AI um, kit. So the the trick though is that um, you know this thing is not powerful enough to train a neural network. That's something you want to do on your PC, but it's powerful enough to run it once it's been trained. So it can do the it can use a neural network to classify new things that it sees. Um, for example, recognize whether you know it's seeing. Um, you know, a flower or a dog. Uh, once it has been trained on a PC, and the and the neural network that resulted out of that 
has been uploaded to this board. Um, so you know you can do simple voice recognition with this, gesture recognition, face recognition, those kinds of things, image recognition um, are definitely possible. And all that still without running a whole operating system. So again, if you don't need the OS, if you don't need the Linux compatibility, um, this might be a good choice because you're keeping a lot of the complexity of running of whole OS with drivers and you know network stacks and stuff, et cetera. Um, away from, from your problem. Okay, so that's the form factor and the electronics. Uh, sorry, the and and the and the embedded coding, the embedded uh, software uh, development. Um, and then we get to the the third part, electronics. And I'm not going to give you a full blown course on electronics here, but I want to explain a bit. Uh, how things have evolved in, in what you can do with prototyping in electronics. Um, the basic way to do prototyping in electronics, uh, and that's the one that's been around for like easily 20 years now, um, is of course with, you know, when you do have your embedded controller, um, you can use these um, simple direct electronic sensors and actuators, right? Um, and I've classified them here into things that are input devices and things that are output devices. And I further classified them into whether they deliver some digital value or some analog value. Um, on the simplest part, we have stuff like a push button or a switch, or maybe um, a multi-key keyboard, a keypad here. These are all input devices that give you just digital on-off um, uh, data, right? And, and that is easily detected with a microcontroller and then sensed in your code, and you can react to that accordingly. Um, on the output side, correspondingly, we have things like LEDs that you can just turn on or off. Um, you can turn them on and off very quickly to, to, to emulate the effect of, of different brightness levels. We'll come to that later. Um, but another form of uh, more advanced digital display control is um, these RGB LEDs in which we, we see an example of a whole ring of RGB LEDs. Uh, and these are basically sent short messages over a serial protocol. Um, and those messages tell the device, you know, turn LED 15 to um, a greenish yellow at 50% brightness, for example. Um, and that happens so fast that you can create animation effects on these things without um, noticeable delays. On the um, analog side, we've got the input side um, where you have things like a light sensor, we can see a light dependent resistor there on the right, or a force sensor that you can press in or that somebody can step on or that you know can detect some weight being put on it um, and thereby changes its resistance gradually. So in an analog, it creates an analog signal. Um, or we've got on the output side, we've got a, a servo motor that can um, drive its um, um, its wheel into into any kind of position on, along a um, you know 270 degree uh, turning axis. Um, and while these are often also controlled using using digital commands, you might say, well, isn't that really a digital out? Yeah, that's where it starts to become a little blurry, right? In the end, of course, all the effects we do are physical effects in the real world, and they ultimately can be measured using analog means. But um, here with a, with a servo motor, for example, uh, you get more of the sense that you're con controlling a continuous angle uh, value with your, with your data. Um, OK, so that's how actually ever since the 50s, probably, this is how you would have worked with electronics. But um, of course, technology hasn't stopped there. Um, and uh, more recently, more modern um, connectivity systems have evolved that uh, you should pay attention to when you are prototyping because they are specifically geared towards prototyping, getting results quickly and reliably without having to go through a lot of fuss, soldering up things, writing you know, dedicated code. One example I wanted to share here is the uh, Quick Connect system. Um, the Quick Connect system was invented by SparkFun and SparkFun is probably, the, you know, not probably, it is the biggest distributor of uh, embedded electronics 
prototyping tools. Um, so sparkfun.com is a page uh, definitely worth checking out. Um, and what SparkFun determined was that it wanted to find a new standard that would allow you to connect simple uh, sensors and actuators much more quickly than, um, than you had uh, before. And also they were noticing that sensors and actuators got more and more complex. You know, you got um, magnetometers and accelerometers and these multi-line displays and, and, and whatnot. So um, they wanted to get to a simple standard to control these things. So what they came up with was basically um, they used a, an industry connector that is standardized. Uh, it's called I squared C, so IIC, which stands for um, inter-integrated circuit um, connector. So the I squared C connector is the is the physical connector that you see here between these uh, between this board here on the left. The board on the left is basically um, an Arduino Uno clone uh, that Sparkfun makes. Um, and the connector here is a, is a four four pin wire connector and goes here to this first thing um, that I don't even know what what that is. Um, the sensors and actuators are all daisy chained using the same uh, connector. So that's literally a bus, right? This is an I squared C bus. So all these devices are on a single bus. Um, the board is being uh, is is usually the the master on the bus is controlling who is being talked to or who's being asked for values, et cetera. And everybody else is listening to those commands and delivering their values or or taking the values that they're being sent uh, where appropriate. So uh, with this system, you can really quickly uh, you know, create a prototype. You literally just plug together your microcontroller board using the standard connectors. You say, I need a display, I need a um, you know, a gyro, maybe you want to build a thing that can sense when your washing machine is done so it can send you a net message, right? So you take a board, you take a um, um, an accelerometer that can sense the vibration, um, and then you maybe take a, I don't know, um, a Bluetooth module or something and to, to talk to your phone. Um, and you put these three together in this simple connect uh, daisy chain, and then um, you write the code. And the code is appropriately, um, there are libraries for, for all these um, uh, boards that SparkFun makes um, that you can then also use in a very fairly standardized way. So um, the key advance here is that it is a standardized, very maker-friendly uh, uh, connector and also um, software protocol along the bus and also a library, a collection of libraries and documentation um, of very affordable sensors and actuators, right? Uh, so each of these boards will cost you, you know, a dollar or a few dollars at most. Um, so you can build a prototype much, much more quickly than if you had to build it with advanced things like a gyroscope um, from scratch, because the, the hours that you spend making that would easily <coughs> um, be more costly than buying these parts. Um, this, of course, is also not a new idea to standardize these things, but it is, it is currently, um, I would probably say, the go-to solution um, if you needed to prototype something that goes beyond just an LED and a, and a few buttons. Um, we actually have um, some kits of, of the um, Quick Connect system at our Fab Lab if you want to play around with these sensors and, and see how they work. Okay, so um, we've now seen form, you know, the 3D printing or laser cutting or, you know, cardboard prototyping. We've seen the function of embedded, you know, embedded coding, um, and we've seen sensors and actuators, um, how you control um, analog and digital outputs and how you sense analog and digital inputs is the way that you connect these two worlds of mechanics and, and your digital logic, right? Um, I wanna show you one example uh, that we created um, about two years or three years ago um, that puts all these things together. We were asked by, um, the local chamber of commerce to create a series of workshops um, for startups so that they could understand how to use um, you know, all these digital fabrication and rapid prototyping, hardware prototyping techniques to their advantage, how to create actual prototypes. And so we you know, we had them all build this, this tree here during an evening event. Every person walked home with their own tree at the end. 
And, and this project here shows all these things at work. So what does this thing do? Well, what it does is you take a colored object, you put it on this little light sensor here at the top, um, you turn it on, and then the tree will light up with its LEDs in the color of the object that you placed on the sensor. So it's, it's just a gadget, right? It doesn't do anything useful. It's just to demonstrate things. But how it's being put together is quite interesting. We have the form aspect um, because the base here was actually created on a laser cutter designed with a 2D design tool and then laser cut out and then you know, assembled into a 3D shape. Uh, that's a really quick way to build 3D shapes, much quicker than 3D printing, for example. Um, we see the uh, form also that we, you know, this, this tree here was something that we couldn't reasonably make with laser cutting. So we went with 3D printing instead. And so we created this in a, in a, a CAD program uh, and then um, printed most of that tree, except for the tips. The tips are actually translucent silicone. Um, and so those were being created using a molding and casting process. And then we see um, the function is there's a programmed Arduino board in, uh, inside this, uh, uh, the space here. Um, that's the embedded code. That's the, that's the brain of this thing. And then how do you make these two things talk to each other? Well, there are sensors and actuators in there. There's an on-off switch. There's this color sensor. And there's LEDs hiding in the branches of this tree. And all of that is, of course, connected to the brain here of the Arduino underneath all of this. So um, this is an example of a project that puts all these three parts together right? um, that I just wanted to, to show you. Last, uh, lastly, we have um, the question of, if I do electronics prototyping, are there any tools that help me with this? Or do I need to plug everything together and hope that it works? You know, and, and you don't. You actually have quite a, a variety of, of support tools available. One that I wanted to show you, uh, we're not going to use it more today because it's for a different purpose than what we need today. But it's very interesting um, is the fritzing tool. The fritzing tool was developed by some uh, folks in uh, Potsdam, I believe. Um, and uh, what it is, is um, it's an electronic design tool. So it's it's a bit like a like a tool to create printed circuit boards to, to design electronic circuits. But it was, again, it was designed for non-engineers. It was, it was written for design schools and design students. And what it actually introduced, it was first released in 2008. So it's also been around for a long time. And its key advance, its key idea was to move away from the traditional way of showing electronic components in these tools, which was you would see schematic uh, uh, things that look nothing like the actual component, but are a, a theoretical representation, right? So a resistor is a little white box, right? Rather than actually being a resistor that you like what it would look like. And a motor would be like an M inside a circle rather than being an actual motor. So here you can see, um, you know, uh, the, in this in this background here, that Fritzing actually depicts these things uh, for real, right? It actually shows you the components as they look in real life, in, including your uh, integrated circuit that you're you plug in here. So you drag and drop your parts here onto uh, onto a board. Uh, you use realistic components. Um, I have a uh, I have a close up here of this in a, in a second. Um, and just the there is another clue here which is once you've plugged everything together, first of all, it gives you a way to simulate what you're doing. So to see whether it's actually doing the right thing. Um, so you can simulate whether your electronic circuit is doing the right thing. And then the software will actually generate a layout um, to create a printed circuit board that you can then stack on top of your Arduino board. So Arduino has this thing called shields that are little little boards the size of the Arduino that you can stack on top. And then they, they connect through all the, 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 the connections. And so you can add functionality to an Arduino board by stacking these shields on top of them. And this software will take your electronic design and create a shield from that that you can then have manufactured by you know, a PCB manufacturer for you. Um, and then once it comes back from the, sh from the shop that makes it for you, uh, you just stack it on top of your Arduino and you've got a very robust setup uh, ready to go into your product, right? Much more robust than the breadboarding that you typically do. 
um, so I've talked about these things. Um, here's a, a zoom in on, on what the Fritzing uh, tool looks like. As you can see here, uh, this is the Arduino board. You can drag in an Arduino board literally from the, the collection of, of parts here on the, on the right-hand side. And then you can drag in an LED and you can literally stick the LED into the pins of the, of the Arduino, right? Um, and as I said, if you took this very simple circuit that is an Arduino board and one LED added to it and had it make a shield for that, it would come up with this design. So it would actually create this printed circuit board all by itself, all automated. Um, and you could then choose where on this board exactly you want to place the LED. If you want to move it around from its default position, that's fine. But it will create the right connections. It will create all these header headers here that go um, and stick into your Arduino. And then you can send that off to an electronic shop and have it have it made right from inside the app for a couple, couple euros. All righty. So um, first thing you want to do is um, if you uh, get out your little box here, um, and uh, what we what we gave you, folks, is um, a whole kit that should have an Arduino in there. And so those people who don't have a kit, just hold on a second until we've got the physical setup solved, and then Zuren will talk you through the virtual simulation instead. Um, and uh, this is the guy that you need to uh, connect to your computer using the included um, USB cable. So you hook that up to your to your computer using the, uh, the USB cable here, plug that in. Um, and uh, once you've plugged it in, you launch the, uh, the IDE. Um, so you start the Arduino IDE. So you should also all have gotten, if you, if you picked up the physical toolkit, you've got this uh, little Arduino in a nutshell booklet uh, on paper. If you don't have that, uh, here's a link that you can go to uh, where you'll find the PDF. So you can actually follow along on that. hci.ac slash Arduino. So if you go to this URL, uh, what you find there is the uh, PDF that has that uh, same booklet around. So you should be able to get that from there. Just click on the on the image of Arduino in a nutshell, and you should be fine. All right, so it's it's right here. On that URL, you'll find the the booklet. Now, uh, next up, let's assume that you've um, you've got the booklet. That booklet will actually take you through the following exercises, and I'm not going to try to keep everybody in sync on this because everybody's going to be at their own pace. Uh, and I don't want you all to to wait for for everybody, uh, but we'll get started together. Maybe get the first thing, you know, getting the blinking LED going, all uh, everybody, and then you can move on at your own swift pace. So if you look at the uh, the little booklet, uh, the introduction will tell you basically what you already know about the Arduino at this point, because um, it just explains how it is different from uh, from a you know, a, for example, a Raspberry Pi, and then. Um, Chapter two basically um, is already uh, describing to you what you need to do to get an LED blinking. You don't need to worry about step one there, uh, getting the uh, electronics pack, because that is something that you got physically from us if you picked it up. And if you didn't, then you'll find all the parts that you need in the simulated environment. You need to download the Arduino IDE um, for your favorite platform for your computer. Uh, from arduino.cc. So make sure that you download that and install it if you haven't already. Um, and uh, once you have uh, the Arduino IDE running, it should look something like this. Hold on, I'm going to just open it up. Okay, so that's your that's your Arduino IDE. It's uh, it's pretty straightforward. And what we're going to do is. Um, you're going to be connecting your board um, via USB to your computer. So I'm going to do that now. And once you've got um, the board connected in, in, to your computer, then you um, open up the, the IDE and uh, you launch the, uh, you go into the tools menu. Um, let me see, I'm going to maybe 
share that uh, share the whole screen with you guys so you can be better see that. Just a sec, because otherwise you're not going to see my menu bar. So that sucks. And uh, okay, and then the Arduino IDE, uh, you just open up as as it says there under step number three. Um, you go to the tools um, board menu, and you make sure that the right board is selected. So here is the tools menu, and the tools menu has a board sub menu. And in that, you'll have to go under the Arduino AVR boards. And in there, the second one is the Arduino Uno. So that's the first step. So now your system knows what kind of board you're running. And the second thing is that you need to select the right port, right? The Arduino is connected using a serial port. Um, and in order to make sure that that's the right one, um, you need to move to the uh, tools port down here. And that should list, once you've plugged it in, it should list actually the Arduino Uno port under something slash def slash blah, 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 with a long name USB modem. Just don't pick the Bluetooth one because you are connected using a, you know, a serial line, obviously. All right. Okay. Now, um, our board is hooked up and uh, the Arduino IDE knows about it and we're gonna just gonna load a sample sketch. Uh, this is the another really nice feature of the Arduino IDE. Uh, it contains lots of example sketches. And in fact, every time somebody releases their own library, they are really encouraged to also include examples that you can access right from the menu here. So let me show you how that works. Uh, I'll go into the file menu, uh, go down to examples, pops up a long list. Yours is gonna be shorter because I have a whole bunch of extras installed here. Uh, and then you go to the built-in examples, basics. And in basics, you pick blink, all right? So that should give you a new window. Now we got two windows. I'm just gonna close the other one. The other one is just an empty, empty uh, program or sketch as it's called in Arduino that doesn't do anything. So I'm gonna close that. So this is our program. Let me make that a little bigger so you guys can all see what's going on in this code. Um, it's not a lot, to be honest. Um, that's all it does. Uh, so there's a whole long explanation of how this code works and who wrote it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and now you can see uh, that this code consists of two parts, right? There's a setup function. This is executed once when the computer starts up, uh, when, the, when the Arduino starts up and it's powered up. Uh, and all that does is it tells the Arduino uh, that there is one pin that it, you would like to use as an output pin, um, which you will, uh, you know, to, to drive an LED. And that pin is the one that has the built-in LED connected. This has a special name. It's called LED built-in. And that's turned to output. On your Arduino Uno, that is actually pin 13. Uh, but on other Arduino models, the pin number may change. That's why we're using this standard um, constant here, the standard name for the for the pin. And now the loop function is executed next and that get, just gets executed indefinitely until uh, the power is turned off. So the loop function does four things. It sends a digital write, um, which basically means that it tells a pin to have a certain level. A digital means it's only high or low and write means that we're setting the pin's value, right? So here we're setting the pin LED built-in, which is pin 13, to uh, five volts, we're setting it to high. Um, your Arduino is powered through the USB cord and, and the whole board is running on five volts. Newer boards use only 3.3 volts. Be careful to not mix that up or you may blow up some parts. Um, so here we have set the, uh, the pin to high and then we wait for a thousand milliseconds, so one second. And then we turn it back off, right? So we turn the uh, pin to zero volts uh, and we wait for another second. And we repeat that endlessly. So we should have one second on, one second off on the LED. But wait, where's the LED? Well, the trick is that the Arduino actually has a couple of LEDs built in, right? And one of these LEDs that is built in is one that is connected to pin 13. Um, and so whatever you send to pin 13 and you know to the pin that goes out will also be 
um, happening um, will also be reflected by this built-in LED. It's like a control LED for that pin. Not every pin has that, only pin 13 has it, uh, but it's very convenient. But currently that's not happening because we haven't uploaded the code yet, right? So for that, what you need to do is basically just uh, click the upload toolbar button and um, I'm showing it in the, in the, in the instructions, but uh, you'll find it also here at the, at the top. It's the right arrow button. It says upload when you hover over it. Uh, so you hit that button, and if everything goes smoothly, it should say compiling sketch here at the bottom for a while, while it's translating your code. Um, usually that you know doesn't take uh, very long, and once it's done, it will say uploading sketch and then done uploading. And at that point, uh, your code has been moved up to your um, board. And as you may be able to see, we now have a blinking LED. Um, there's an ember, like orangey LED blinking next to pin 13 now. You see that? Yeah. Right. So that's it. That, that's the first experiment. So um, what you can now do is you can go in and change the value of delay to different values uh, and see you know, how you change basically the duration of the LED being on and off, just to play with it a bit and, and read you know, just hit upload again once you've changed something and see how the frequency changes. All right, uh, we're now uh, going to take the, um, Zürn is going to take the, the digital folks, uh, the, the emulator folks through the same paces so that we can get you to the same level. And after that, uh, we will continue just on, on one thread of this. Yeah, what you now see here are uh, two windows. On the right, you see the Blink example uh, that was actually shown before. So we are going to use this code in a, in a few seconds to yeah do the same on our board as uh, Professor Borchers did on his physical board. Mm. Uh, yeah, right, I forgot to replace me in Spotlight for a second, right. And um, yeah, on the left side, you see a Tinkercad. Uh, this should be the view if you have created your account uh, and logged in already. If you didn't have so, uh, just go to tinkercad.com, uh, create an account. You can use a throwaway email. It doesn't have to be persistent by now. Um, and yeah, I guess you can even start to use your whole uh, toolkit without uh, confirming your, your email. So that should be done quickly. Um, then you're going to be in, on, on this dashboard and uh, we are going to use uh, the circuits uh, section for today. And we are going to create a new circuit by clicking on, on this button here. And then we are going to uh, launch up the whole emulator. And uh, yeah, first of all, let me give you a brief introduction what we see here. We have uh, yeah, some kind of canvas where we're going to put our parts later. Then we have some, some toolbar for copying, deleting things, uh, undo, redo, adding comments. Uh, maybe very important, uh, you can change the wire color. So if you're going to add a bunch of uh, stuff and using different uh, Wire colors will help you to to yeah keep an overview, know which wire uh, has which meaning. We're going to over this a bit later, but keep in mind you can change the color here. Mm, what you might not mean, need this much is the wire type. We're only using a normal or hookup. Um, you can just leave it at normal. It doesn't yeah has any influence on the on the simulation. It just uh, yeah is for for visual uh, means. Then on the right side, we have our uh, components list here. For example, you see uh, the micro bit we talked uh, a few moments ago. You see our Arduino, uh, the nine volt battery, etc. cetera. Um, all right, and uh, yeah, we can just use those components. For example, the Arduino Uno um, and uh, drag and drop them onto our canvas. And um, yeah, here you see you have the, the, the same uh, pins as, as on the hardware version. You have uh, the button here, you have the USB. You can uh, plug in by uh, clicking later here on start simulation. So then our Arduino is uh, virtually powered up and uh, the code is executed. 
and um, yeah, we can can also uh, add other parts. Uh, just just give me a. I just want to give you an idea which parts we are going to use later on. For example, we see here a breadboard small, but uh, as you can see, uh, especially the, the the folks who have the the hardware kit, this is even larger than the one uh, we are going to use. So if we are later adding a breadboard. I would recommend to add the breadboard mini so you have the visually exact um, representation as, as we use in the hardware version. All right, but uh, so far we only need our Arduino and now we need somehow to get our code on this virtual Arduino. And therefore we're going to click on, on this code thingy here, the code button. And yeah, in, in this uh, Tinkercad, you can use uh, some, some uh, block coding approach, like, like they're a bit similar to Scratch, uh, but we are going to use the text approach. And yeah, we are pretty sure that we are advanced enough to, to use the text editor. And um, yeah, as you can see uh, here is already the, the blinking example, but uh, for later examples, yeah, you can just use uh, your Arduino IDE copy the code and uh, paste it in here so you can um, yeah, follow along if you're going to use other code from the Arduino IDE. All right, now we have set up our hardware, we have our code and uh, yeah, what, what is the equivalent to the upload button in the simulator is the start simulation. If I'm not going to press the button, you can see we have uh, our little LED blinking uh, uh, in, in, in every every second. And uh, here we go. Um, what now is interesting, and I guess Professor Borges is going to tell this later or stressing this a bit more, uh, we won't change our wiring while we are powered on because uh, bad things can happen. We can create sh short circuits, uh, et cetera. And, um, yeah, the simulation here won't even won't let you do this. So, so if I want to now create a wire by clicking on one of the pins here, it, it doesn't work. Uh, so if you want to change something and it didn't work, uh, yeah, have a look at, at the top right corner if you may be still in, in the simulation mode. So first of all, stop the simulation. And if you now want to uh, wire things up, you can use a breadboard, uh, as I told before. And by clicking, for example, on the ground pin here, and then dragging this over to one of the of the holes here of the breadboard of the pins, and clicking again, you're adding a wire. And uh, I guess it's selected, so I can uh, also change the color, for example, to black. All right, I guess that's enough uh, for the moment. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to ask. If you have questions uh, during the uh, further experiments we're going to do, just raise your hand right in the chat. I, I'll try to, to answer them and try to help you to get uh, as close as possible experience to having a real device on your desk. All right, cool. Thank you very much, um, Zoran, for the, uh, the virtual demo here. Uh, and uh, we're going to move back to the uh, the physical realm for now. So what I would propose now is um, I will start with the next uh, example, and I will talk you all, uh, folks, all through the other examples here. Uh, but do feel free if you if you're a fast reader and a fast um, electronics into breadboard plugger, um, then uh, you know feel free to go faster. Or if you um, you don't skip any of the of the uh, exercises because they are meant to build up a certain kind of knowledge for you. Uh, but we're going to just continue with these things. And every now and then I'm going to mention some things that you should all be taking away from from the experiments. Right? We're not just doing the experiments to do the experiments. We're doing them to learn something particular about the system. Uh, also, I'm going to be talking about the physical setup here. Uh, but if you have, um, you know, there are more people in here who are on the virtual system or I guess we're roughly half half. Um, so if you have a virtual uh, question around Tinkercad, then uh, maybe uh, post it in the chat for Zoran to to pick up. 
Uh, and if you do have an issue with a physical board, just speak up here um, and, and I'll try to address it, okay? All right, so what we've done now, we've played with the Uno, we've uploaded code to a microcontroller. Congratulations on that. Um, next up, we're going to show that this thing actually runs by itself, right? Uh, this is done very simply in, in the experiment number three um, because what you can do is, of course, um, you can just disconnect your uh, your board from from uh, power, and then of course it stops lighting up. You take your your battery, your nine volt block with the uh, with the attached connector here, and you plug that into the Uno, um, and your code starts back up again, right? So your LED resumes blinking. Um, we should be seeing that. Yeah, there we can see it. Uh, so. This is a small thing, right? It's just a blinking LED, but it's a big issue because you are now actually have, as you can see, you have a completely self-contained system that is actually pretty small, right? A nine volt block and this Arduino Uno can go into you know, a small project box and you can build that into whatever prototype you're building. So this is important to understand that the code runs on the Arduino without it requiring a connection back to the computer. There are some things that you are doing that will require a connection back to the computer. Um, but um, you don't need it for the, the most fundamental things. Like you can drive all these pins and read signals from these IO pins without having to talk back to your computer. One thing that the connection to the computer is extremely useful for is, of course, debugging. And we'll get to that in just um, a few minutes. Um, there are some minor hints here in the book that uh, I just want to reiterate. Uh, what's actually happening is this plug can take anything from 7 to 12 volts. It will convert that down to the to the appropriate uh, uh, amount. Um, and um, if you uh, want to drive this thing with 5 volts, you need to go through the USB port. Um, don't try to attach that to the 5 volt pin on the board. Uh, it's not a 5 volt ingoing line. It's actually supposed to supply 5 volts to other parts you are connecting once the Arduino is powered through the USB port or through the um, nine volt port. All right. Um, so uh, moving on to uh, chapter four, um, connecting a big LED. If you check in your, in your box, um, then you will find that there is a, a, a big red or green uh, or yellow LED. Um, and those folks come with a long and a short uh, leg, as you, as you may know, right? So one leg is slightly longer, one leg is slightly shorter, um, and, and uh, the short one is the, the, the negative side. So the long one is the, the positive side. And you can actually plug these in. Um, and here comes uh, Zürn's comment. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to you know, build on that now. Uh, before we do any reconnections on our board, we always um, make sure that we disconnect power. All right, so um, disconnect power or turn off your power before you change anything about your circuit. It doesn't break things automatically if you don't do this, but if you ever create by accident a short circuit, which happens very quickly by just plugging something in wrong, um, you know, off by one pin is kind of like the hardware equivalent of the off by one error in code. It happens a lot. Uh, and that can quickly break your stuff. So plug the LED in, um, and it goes with its its long lead uh, towards the the right uh, to the pin that is labeled um, uh, five. Uh, what is labeled uh, thirteen, I think. And uh, the short lead goes into the pin labeled ground. Uh, the ground label is also is, is printed in white, uh, in black on white, so it's in verse color, so you can easily uh, recognize it. Um, so it look should should look something like like this roughly, right? Um, and once that's plugged in, you can then reconnect uh, your USB cable because we don't need to run it off the battery anymore. It was just to demonstrate that this is possible. But we'll use the USB cable for power because then we can also upload our code immediately. The moment you do that, uh, your big LED bing begins blinking because our code actually was switching pin 13 back and forth, right? Um, uh, the onboard LED that we were driving at the same time there 
was just basically helping us to see that. You will also notice something else, your onboard LED. Anybody noticing something about the onboard LED? Team physical? Uh, I guess it's still blinking. Yes, but is it blinking differently than before? before? Yeah, it's not blinking as uh, strongly as before. It's yeah. Uh, I didn't see it at first until you said it's still blinking. Yes, exactly. It's blinking only uh, weekly, and that is because we are actually overtaxing our Arduino right now. Um, LEDs always need to be connected with a resistor in series to limit the current that flows through them. If you don't do that, they will take essentially as much current as they can get meaning that they essentially create a short circuit on, on, your, on your electronics. Now, why isn't everything in flames right now? It's because the Arduino itself has a short circuit protection built in. So at 40 milliamps, um, it sort of you know, dials down um, the power that is going out the connection. But because the Arduino is struggling to supply as much current as it can outside out of that pin, that is why we're seeing that the built-in LED is not getting enough anymore now. No. So basically, all the current is now flowing through your external LED, uh, and only very little is left for the internal LED because they are essentially set in parallel. And the internal LED, of course, has a proper current-limiting resistor in series, whereas your external one doesn't right now. So it's taking all the current uh, at the moment. Uh, so we're also driving this LED a little bit over spec, right? Uh, LEDs are usually built to take 20 milliamps of current, and we're driving it at closer to 40 milliamps right now, if you were to measure it. Um, doesn't mean that it blows up just yet, but it will seriously shorten its lifespan. So uh, that's why we don't usually, um, don't usually do that. Okay. Um, That's already, you know, experiment number four. So, um, and experiment number five will add the resistor that I was talking about to make this a proper circuit, right? How you would really drive an LED if you were building a project. Um, so we need to figure out what kind of resistor we need for that. First of all, you can disconnect your, your, your Arduino. Uh, and now there's a little bit of uh, mathematics involved um, because, I said earlier that normal these normal LEDs, these these you know five millimeter round LEDs, they take about uh, twenty milliamps of current, right? That's what they're happy with. That's they don't need any more. They don't get any brighter if you put more through them. Um, they just burn out more quickly. The other thing that an LED does uh, is that it drops, roughly speaking, uh, two volts of voltage. So. If you were to measure the voltage on one end and on the other end of the LED, normally you would see a difference of two volts there. Um, if you want to know exactly how much your LED is dropping, then you need to basically know where your LED is coming from, what color it is. It, it depends a little on color. Some drop 1.9, 2.1, 2.3 volts, but roughly speaking, it's it's two volts. So we've got five volts. The LED will drop two volts, um, so we need to get rid of the other three volts, and we need to get rid of these other three volts while the current flowing through the whole thing is 20 milliamps. That sounds a lot like Ohm's law, right? Are you getting flashbacks to your physics classes from like seventh grade, or maybe, I don't know, to your technical computer science classes a couple of years ago? Um, so. What we need to do is we need to find out what resistor we need, uh, we need to use in order so that if it drops three volts, uh, 20 milliamps flow through it, right? And that's Ohm's law at work. Uh, I wrote it down in the little booklet here. Um, you can figure it out quite easily. Um, I like to remember Ohm's law as this, this triangle of letters like U above the slash and then R and I be beneath the, the line. And from that, you can derive all, all different rules at the same time, right? So for example, that means that if I have the voltage, if I need, need the voltage and I have a resistance and a current, because R is the resistance and I is the current, then I need to do U equals R times I, right? 
if I need the resistance like we do now and I have the voltage and the current, I know it's R equals U divided by I. That's what this writing it down in this triangle uh, form uh, is trying to do for you. So it's an easy way to remember Ohm's law. So you'll always know I equals U divided by R, et cetera, et cetera. So now we need to basically just take our uh, three volts and divide them by 20 milliamps. 20 milliamps is uh, 20 thousandths of an amp, right? Or 0.02 amps, uh, amperes. Uh, and that turns out to be 150, right? So five divided by 0.02 is the same as, um, uh, sorry, three divided by 0.02 is the same as three times 50. That's 150. So um, that means that we need a 150 ohm resistor. Um, now, I only gave you very few resistors there, not to confuse the heck out of everybody. Um, so unless you have your own electronics toolbox at home, you can use the resistor supplied with this kit. Um, now, you'll find there's two resistors in there, right? And they have different color codes, if you look at them carefully. One of them will have something like orange, orange, brown on it, and then a gold line. The gold line is always the one that goes all the way to the right, if you want to read them. So you start from the side that's opposite the golden line, gold or silver line, and that's orange, orange, brown. Um, and that translates into a certain voltage. If you want to figure out what that translates to, uh, you just Google something like resistor color codes online. I'll show you an example. That's probably good enough. Um, you can see that each ring basically has a particular meaning, right? So orange is a three. So we got three lines of orange, uh, two lines of orange, that's 33. Uh, and then we have a brown uh, as, the, as the third line. And brown at its third position means times 10 to the power of one, so times 10. So that's 33 times 10, that's 330. Okay, so the first, in a, in a normal four band resistor, which you usually find, uh, you have basically three lines that giving you the value, and then the fourth line is the, is the precision, uh, the tolerance of the resistor. 5% if it's a golden band, um, and 10% uh, if it's a silver band. So here we have orange, orange, brown, which translates to 330, volt, uh, 330 ohms uh, with plus or minus 5%. Uh, with a 5% tolerance, sorry. Um, sometimes you run into five band resistors. Um, if, you know, then they give you four bands uh, to determine the value. In this case, you've got three digits and then a multiplier uh, and then the tolerance. All right. So uh, can anybody tell me what this other resistor is that you find in your kit? Uh, should be 10 kilo ohms. That's right. Yeah. Brown is a one, black is a zero, so it's 10. And then uh, um, orange means times 10 to the power of three, so times a thousand, so that's 10,000 ohms. Uh, and then the golden 10, so that's a 5% tolerance. And 10,000 ohms is 10 kilo ohms, as Leo was saying. Right, cool. Um, so uh, we need the one that's orange, orange, brown, not the other one. Uh, but you know, with that, with that resistor then, if you are so inclined, you can then figure out uh, at what uh, at what level it will glow. Uh, that will come on the next side. So turn over to page eight in the in the instructions um, and uh, take a look at what we're doing there. So we're disconnecting USB power. You get out your uh, little mini PCB here. That's the one that Zorn was was showing how to find in the in the, in the virtual. Uh, Tinkercad setting, uh, and plug your both your LED um, and the uh, um, sorry and, and the uh, resistor into it. Uh, I would actually recommend using the uh, holes that I'm using in the example because we are going to be building on uh, on this, and we're going to add more stuff later. And it'll be easiest to place everything if you follow along with uh, where I'm placing the connections on the on the board there. So you can plug that in, should have uh, 
your resistor in there. And then we gave you a bunch of uh, connector wires, right? And um, I also recommend using the colors that, that I'm using in the image. Um, for example, that's what the yellow uh, alert box is telling you in the, in the manual here. Um, it's talking about that. Um, always use black for ground, use red for, for your, your five volts. Um, and then, you know, make up a consistent, uh, you know, mapping of colors to, uh, to meanings or to signal types for the rest. It will really help you debug your circuit later if you're, if you're struggling with something not working right. So I'll be plugging in the uh, yellow one here where the uh, resistor is. And it uh, goes here to pin 13, right next to the, the ground pin. So basically, we've now connected it so that from pin 13, it goes through the resistor because the breadboard um, has connections hidden behind um, behind its surface that go um, <clears throat> um, like this. Let me, let me show you real quick. Uh, so basically, in, in breadboards, these five pin rows are all connected electrically. So all pins in one row here, or column I should maybe say, are connected electrically. Uh, in the next row, they are also connected to each other, but you know, there's no connection sideways. Um, that's important to know about a breadboard. So you can plug something in anywhere alongside one of these rows and it'll all be um, electrically connected to each other. If you have larger breadboards that have like top and bottom um, horizontal rows, then that means that these horizontal rows are also connected and that they're usually used for um, five volts or for, for ground connections to give you a power rail, so to say. Anyway, um, we've plugged it in that way. So we now go from, from pin 13 um, to our resistor over to the other end of the resistor into the LED, hopefully the positive end of the LED because LEDs do have a direction. They only work in one direction. They are a diode after all. And diodes only connect uh, conduct current in one direction, and then you go back through the black line into the ground pin. Right, easy enough. Once you've got that set up, you plug in your power again, and what you should be seeing is that your big LED is now blinking, essentially almost as bright as before. You shouldn't really be seeing any any noticeable difference there. Um, but now that we've got that set up, we are actually treating the LED much nicer. And you will also notice that your onboard LED is back to its former glory, uh, glowing nicely, nice and bright, uh, because not all the current is being sucked into the external LED. All right, that's it for Team Physical for the moment. Um, what you can do is you can try to figure out. Um, I've got some calculations in the book if you want to if you want to uh, uh, cheat and read ahead, or you can try to figure it out for yourself how much current is actually flowing through the LED now because it's not 20 milliamps, because for that we would have needed 150 ohms. So you can do the calculations yourself if you want, or read on in the book to find out how much current we're now actually uh, running through the LED. Um, I think we can move on. Um, the, um, the actual current flowing through the LED, as you probably figured out, is now three volts divided by 330 ohms. So that's about nine milliamps. Um, and um, it doesn't matter where you put the resistor before or after the LED because it's a serial circuit and the current is the same in every part of a serial circuit as you may remember from your electronics uh, lectures. Um, we're gonna move on to, uh, this, this was digital out, right? So we now have understood fundamentally how we can make a pin on the Arduino uh, control an outgoing voltage to be high or low and thereby drive a small current through something that like an LED to make it blink or uh, if you wanted to drive something uh, like a speaker, if you connected a, a little piezo speaker at this point, it would go click, clack, click, clack each time you turn the polarity around. Um, anything larger you want to do, like a motor, you will have to work uh, usually with, um, with transistors um, in order to drive larger loads. So uh, what's, up, what's up next is basically uh, connecting a, a button, right? So we disconnect the USB port. Um, we take a push button out. Um, it's this tiny little thing here. Um, note that the push button actually has a direction. Um, it will only fit in one way. 
um, the pins that are closer to each other need to be actually next to each other, right? So um, they are the ones that, that will connect when you push push in. Uh, the pins that are below beneath each other uh, are always connected. So these two are always connected. Um, these two are always connected, and it will connect from left to right basically when you push it in. So get that push button into your board all the way to the right. It's a little fiddly. You may need to bend the uh, pins apart just a bit if it or if it doesn't work. There you go. And then uh, you take that other resistor that we had earlier on, the brown, black, orange, gold one, and add that to the left of the push button. There you go. All right, should look something like that. And then we need some more wires. We're now going to take the five volts out of the uh, connector at the bottom of the Arduino. So Arduino should be like this. So we're going to get the five volts from over here. It's again right next to the uh, the ground connection, and the ground connections are easy to see because they've got the white marking. And that'll go to the left of the um, resistor. We got a ground connector to the right of the push button. And that can go into the ground pin next to the five volts at the bottom here, like so. And then we actually need the current voltage at the connection between the push button and the resistor, because that's what we're interested in. So that will go in here, for example. And that then connects to um, I think pin two. Yeah. Right on. Should look something like that. Well, the resolution is not the greatest here, I have to say. Anyway, um, once you've got that plugged together, uh, we're going to talk about uh, what we need to do. We actually need to change some of our code as well. And so you go back to your um, Arduino code. So what we're doing is, is very simple, right? We need to, first of all, tell the Arduino that we're using another pin and how we are going to use it. Are we using it as an input or as an output? We're using it as an input. Uh, that's why we're going to um, add something uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the program to, to tell it that it's an input button. Uh, and we're going to use the push button on pin two. And I'm just going to introduce uh, a, a global variable here. in push button equals two, right? That's all we're going to uh, do. That's just going to make the rest of our code a little easier to read. Now, um, in the loop function, we need to add basically something that says that we're only going to do this whole blinking while the button is being held down, right? So right around here, uh, we're going to put digital read. As you can see, uh, the uh, Functions are named quite logically, right? If digital read of push button equals low, then curly braces start. The rest should be indented appropriately. And this is where this ends. Doop, and we're done. So what does that do? Only if the pin two, which is the push button pin, is uh, at zero volts, then we do our blinking. If it is not at zero volts, we stop blinking. Right? We we halt this this whole thing. We basically skip the whole blinking routine here. Um, we should be nice people and tell the Arduino that we are now using um, the push button as input. 
you don't technically have to do that at this point because all pins on a microcontroller are wired as input buttons, uh, as input uh, pins by default. Uh, that is in order to minimize any damage that could happen, right? If you wire something as an input uh, pin, then it's like a it's like a connector of a voltmeter. It will just detect any voltages coming in, but it won't drive anything or or short circuit anything. Um, but it's good style to do this also for a programmer that reads your code, like yourself in three months. You know, oh yeah, I used the push button pin as well, and I used it as an input, so that makes your code easier to read. All right, so um, digital input means that we get a zero uh, or low uh, if we are at zero volts and a high signal, um, a constant high if we are at five volts. Now, um, if you turn over, uh, you'll find that um, there's, first of all, there's a, uh, there's a box that tells you how to get help. Um, it's a really useful thing if you want to know, oh, wait a moment, how, how again did do I write the digital write function? You can just basically select it or put your cursor into it and then go to the help menu. Um, and in the help menu, select uh, the uh, option find in reference. And what that does is it pops up a new window. Um, I just I just did that and and you basically end up for example, here with the digital write function um, and the reference is right here. Right? So that's really useful <coughs> to quickly get to any um, documentation for your functions. So make use of the help menu in Arduino. It's actually, it is actually helpful, unlike many other help functions. All right, um, so um, back to our code. Here we are. So we've added that code, and now all that's left is basically to um, um, to hit the upload button, connect your power again, right? Which you disconnected before, obviously. Um, and um, currently, it's not doing anything yet because it's still running the old code, right? So currently, it's just blinking away happily whether I press that button or not, right? It doesn't make any difference. Uh, it's not detecting that yet, but if I upload the code um, to the processor, to the Arduino, then it keeps blinking, but if I push the button, ha, ah, my code is wrong. Awesome. This is the moment that I love about live demos, because it tells you that I did something wrong, and I'm wondering what it might be. All right. Great, great example of having to debug our code, I suppose. So the first thing to check is um, for wiring, seeing if your wiring is, is all in place. I mean, we haven't changed anything about the output side. Uh, and we've wired up the input side to go from our uh, resistor to 5 volts. and from our push button to ground. And in between, we've got the pin two connection that is detecting what's going on, should be detecting what's going on. Okay, so the electronics actually look okay. Never mind, that's a demo effect. One thing I wanted to explain about this circuit is, is a voltage divider, because that's a very typical setup that you have, right? So in the book, uh, we've got this explanation here. Uh, what we're really doing is we've got our five volts over here, and we've got our ground over here, so zero volts, and we are putting two things in series. We're putting the 10K resistor and the push button in series, right? And so what voltage do we measure right here? Well, if the push button is open, then it's still going to be five volts because even though there's a resistor between us and the five volt connection, there is no current flowing, right? Because there's no connection to ground anywhere. Um, you might say, but wait, there's current flowing into pin two, right? Yes, there is, but the current that is flowing into pin two is almost non existent. Uh, these microcontrollers use modern uh, you know, semiconductor logic uh, circuits and they have hardly any um, current consumption in the ingoing 
uh, uh, ingoing ports, right? So if you remember, uh, you may have talked about MOSFETs in, in your technical informatics class or um, in your hardware-oriented classes. Um, these modern um, semiconductor circuits for, for many decades now essentially don't actually need current. They just need a, an electrical field, right? Um, that's why they're called field effect transistors. So anyway, long story short, there this thing is more like a voltmeter, right? The pin is you know connecting to this point here, like a voltmeter, and it's saying, well, I'm seeing the five volts here through the resistor, but it's no current flowing, so the resistor doesn't drop any voltage, so it's five volts. Um, nothing is pulling the um, the voltage at this point down. Now, if you close the push button, of course, two things happen, right? First one is uh, your You've now got a closed circuit, right? From uh, five volts through the resistor to your through your push button to ground. So there's going to be current flowing, and the current is five volts, um, managed by these ten kilo ohms. And you can again think about your uh, ohms law, and figure out how much current is currently flowing. Anybody has an idea? Uh, I think it's half a milliamp, but I might be wrong with the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, usually if, if we're wrong with these things, we're wrong by like a factor of a thousand, right? <laughs> exactly. No, but you're right. That's that's absolutely right, Leah. Um, it's a, it's half a milliamp, so 0.5 milliamps, because it's five divided by 10,000. Um, all right, so that's one thing happening. The other thing that's happening is, of course, now your pin two is connected via a bare wire to ground. So there's no reason for it to show anything else but zero volts. And this is what the pull-up resistor is there for, right? The function of the pull-up resistor is to make sure that while you have essentially um, the push button open, it pulls the voltage up to five volts. Whereas when you close the push button, it connects down to ground and gives you a clean zero volts. That's the function of a pull-up uh, resistor. If you want to try this, what you can do is you can momentarily disconnect your pull-up resistor and pull it out and just have the push button connected. Because let's be honest, that could be an easy mistake to make for a beginner, just to take a push button, connect it to one of the pins, maybe wire the push button up to five volts and say, hey, when I close the push button, it's five volts. And when it's open, it's not connected to five volts. So it must be zero, right? Well, it's not. If you do that and you don't have the con pin connected to anything, it's essentially floating. It's a floating pin, something we all dare in electronics and computing as a result, because it's unpredictable. Um, it basically works like a tiny little antenna. And whether it's high or low will depend on whether Darth Vader just swung his lightsaber somewhere. You know, uh, So it's cosmic rays, whatever, um, electrical fields. Um, it's like a touch sensor or a proximity sensor. Sometimes you can then make a change by just getting your hand close by. So it's it's very quickly turning into magic and black art. Um, so it's unreliable. The other problem about this is that this can often lead to rapidly oscillating states, and that will consume a lot of current because every time our modern uh, semiconductors switch uh, from you know plus to minus, they actually do use some current, whereas in their steady state, they use very little current. So we don't want that. We especially don't want our circuits to be sort of like these transistors to be halfway open. That's just not good. Uh, takes a lot of current. Anyway, so um, that's why we have pull-up resistors. And pull-up resistors are so fundamental and so universally used in electronic circuits with microcontrollers uh, that they are built into the Arduino, which is what experiment seven is about. So in experiment seven, you can actually go ahead and try uh, using the built-in pull-up resistor. So um, as I said, the first thing you do is you pull out your resistor. Um, you may want to disconnect power for this. Uh, you pull out your resistor and remove the pull-up resistor, right, the right-hand one. When you do that, you have the situation that I just talked about. Now your connection is open. Um, and when you push the button, everything is clear because you have got a defined zero volts on your um, pin two. But if, your pin is op uh, if the push button is open, the voltage on pin two is not defined. So that's what makes the problem. But if we now go into our code and change it to say that the mode of our input pin is actually not just input, but input underscore pull up. Let me show you what that looks like. 
So we change this line here into input underscore pull up. That is a defined uh, constant in the Arduino environment. Uh, that means that this pin will actually have an internal pull-up resistor enabled that is inside the microcontroller. So the microcontroller, if you say this, says that the pin is going to be an input pin, so it's going to detect voltages, but a circuit gets closed electrically inside the microcontroller that pulls that pin up to 5 volts through a internal resistor. I think it's around 20 kilo ohms or something, that internal resistor. Um, and uh, so that means that this pin will never float. It will always be five volts unless you pull it down to zero volts actively at its input with something else like the push button. And then you can leave out this external resistor, which makes your circuit easier to build. Um, and you are using the built-in um, pull-up uh, resistor in your code. So um, plug your board back in. Uh, notice that as long as the pull-up resistor isn't enabled, it may act strangely. You can play with that a bit, but maybe you don't see anything weird. Uh, it's really unpredictable uh, what it does. And once you upload the code, you've got the pull-up resistor enabled. And with the enabled pull-up resistor, uh, you should now be seeing um, that it only works when you push down the button. Oh, look at that. My code now works too, uh, which means that I probably had um, this, uh, maybe the breadboard has, has a problem or I didn't plug the um, pull-up resistor in correctly. All right, so that's the pull-up resistor. Um, very useful thing to, um, to make use of. Now we've read digital values, right? We've read a value digitally uh, that is high or low. We're going to move on to eight reading analog values. And again, if I'm going to slow for you guys, uh, do feel free to jump ahead, try out extra crazy stuff. Just use the time you have here in this class that we have together to learn as much as you can about the Arduino. Um, let's do that. Reading analog values. What are we going to do? We're going to disconnect USB. We're going to take the push button out. And instead, we're going to connect the force sensing resistor. That, again, sounds like a Star Wars reference, but it isn't. Um, so the force sensing resistor gets, pu uh, gets plugged in. Um, and we are still using the, the 10K uh, resistor. So I need to put that back in. Just build the circuit as it is shown on the um, in the instruction booklet. That's probably much more helpful than trying to follow along what I'm doing here. Yeah, and if you're learning nothing else from today's class, here's a little uh, nice hack. If you have these uh, electronic components that are hard to plug into uh, into your breadboard, if you take them and cut off the end of the wire at an angle with a with some uh, with a pair of of, of um, cutters. Uh, they will be really sharp, like a needle, so you can poke yourself and draw blood. But that's not the point. The point is that they then really slide nicely without any resistance into these breadboards, and you have fewer bent legs and stuff like this. So that's a nice life hack for your electronics. All right, so once you've got that set up with the, uh, uh, with the force sensing resistor, you know, nothing else in the, in the thing changes except we are no longer going to the digital input port because actually these pins up here cannot sense analog voltages. You need to go to uh, the bottom of the board. A uh, little hard to see on the printout maybe, um, but we are actually going down to um, analog pin zero um, at the bottom here of the, of the board, right? So we're now down to A0 with the connection of the blue wire. All right, uh, once you've done that, <clears throat> you now need to um, uh, connect power and upload the sketch from the example. So we actually don't need to write any code for this. That's that's the beauty. Uh, we're just gonna use an existing example se sketch again from the file menu examples. Um, it's in the, uh, what's it saying there? Uh, examples 0.03, uh, 03 point analog, right? So. Section three is called analog. And in there, we have a program that's called analog input. And that's the one that you're loading. You can close the other one if you like. You don't need it anymore. So this code basically just uh, reads the, um, 
you know, defines the sensor pin PA0, the LED pin is 13. Uh, it's the same thing as the, the they could have said um, LED built in here that would have meant the same for the UNO board. Uh, and we're defining a value sensor value, right? Um, we're setting the LED pin as an output. They are not mentioning that the sensor pin should be an input. Um, you know, it would be nice to to do that here, but they they don't. Um, and then we have basically we read the analog value from the sensor pin, which is a zero, and then we turn the LED on. Then we wait for as long as we read as a value, and then we turn the LED off again and wait again for as long as we see the value. So basically, what that means is depending on how hard we press the the force sensor, um, the LED should start blinking slowly or or uh, or or rapidly. So give that a shot with your with your circuit setup. See if that that's what it does after you've uploaded your code, of course. So once it's uploaded, we see a flickering, and that flickering changes when you when you press hard, and it the the LED gets goes really low, uh, slow. Whereas if you let go, then the LED becomes faster and faster. And it's kind of hard to get to middle values in in here. Um, because the force sensitive resistor uh, reacts very quickly to changes. All right. Um, one thing that's maybe important to understand is the uh, the analog values that you're reading uh, are being translated, right? So zero volts is translated to a zero, and five volts gets translated into a ten twenty three. So. Um, it's it's it has a resolution of one k different uh, sample levels that it can detect. So more pressure basically means uh, higher voltage because again, if you look at what we're doing here, uh, we are again creating a um, a voltage divider. Let me stop the screen share here. There we go. We're get, again creating a voltage divider, right? So we've got the five volts. We've got a ground here. A0 is in the middle, and on the one end, we have our uh, force-sensitive resistor, and the other part of it is a fixed 10 kilo ohm resistor. So the harder you press a force-sensitive resistor, the closer the particles inside this little film get together, and that lowers their resistance, right? Best, more current can flow when they're closer together, um, and that means that the voltage then goes up as you press the resistor. So the voltage goes up, that means that A0 picks up a higher value. So now we know how to read analog voltage, voltages, right? Um, maybe the last thing we, we're going to do before we wrap up here today is, is debugging, because this is something extremely important to understand. Um, for this, unfortunately, you don't need to change anything about your electronic setup right now. All you need to do now is basically just go ahead and uh, load a different example. It's called analog read serial, right? So get that from the basics section, not from the analog section. Go to your Arduino um, and open up file examples, basics, analog read serial, upload that code. And uh, that changes the code that's on the board. And now I would like you to, I'm gonna actually um, spot, uh, share my analog, my, my Arduino screen again. It's this one. And now when you do this, um, click this weird button here on the right. That is actually the uh, the serial monitor, this little um, magnifier glass. And when you click that, um, you should get a, a serial monitor window that opens up. You can't see it right now. I'm not sharing it currently. Um, but that basically means um, that we are now looking at a uh, at the output that the um, Arduino is creating over the serial line. And let me show you what that looks like if I if I uh, change my share to that other window. Um, I think it's this one. There we go. it's It's basically an endless stream of running zeros, right? And if I now press the sensor here, you can see that the values are changing, right? Now I'm, I'm pressing very lightly. I'm getting in something in the hundreds. Pressing a little harder, it goes up into the 500s. Pressing pretty hard, I'm up at 800. And I can, uh, just if I press really, really hard, I might be able to trigger into the 10, 000, into the thousands. But yeah, I'm not really able to do that. 
not I'm, I'm too weak. Um, so what you're seeing here is this is how you get data back from your Arduino live into your computer to show, right? So your Arduino can talk to your computer over a serial line um, using a serial protocol, and that's exactly what uh, the code is doing. It is actually um, here. Uh, take it's opening a serial connection with this simple command, uh, giving a baud rate uh, bits per second, uh, nine thousand six hundred, and then we basically just read the value and we print it out the serial port, right? Uh, and then we wait for a millisecond just not to overload the serial port completely with with too much data. So we're only sending a thousand values a second, and that's easily done by the the serial port. Um, Make sure that the port, uh, the the speed of your serial communication here is the same that you set in your code as what you set at the bottom right um, in in your in your uh, serial terminal window. It has a setting down there that says that you know what the baud rate is. That needs to be the same. Um, that's important so that it works. So this is a great way to basically do uh, what I would call print statement debugging, right? So you can insert stuff into your code saying. I've reached my initialization routine and I've finished my initialization routine and thereby uh, get these things out on your computer and see them on your terminal. And this is much more useful than just having LEDs blinking when something happens, right? The simplest way of debugging is of course to use the built-in LED or, or connected LEDs to, to light up when stuff is happening, but this is not very informative. And so using serial print uh, uh, debugging is, is a pretty comfortable way well, reasonably comfortable way for the small programs you tend to write on these things uh, to actually do, do debugging. All right, with that, we are at the end of our time. So that's why I'm just gonna wrap this up here at this point uh, and just tell you briefly what, what you're missing or what you may not be missing if you, if you already went ahead and did it anyway. Uh, so we've got another chapter here on analog output where you can try to connect a, uh, you know, try to see how you can actually make um, things light up different brightnesses using pulse width modulation. So uh, shorter or longer pulses uh, will um, you know, correspond to perceived lower or higher brightness if you do it fast enough. Of course, Bloch's law, right? Way from, way from uh, DIS1 comes in again. If you do it fast enough so we don't realize the changes, um, then it seems to us just like as if the uh, uh, LED was um, shining more brightly or less brightly. That's exactly how you dim your LEDs at home with, with your lamps that you have. They use pulse width modulation too. Um, so if you have a very high speed camera, you can actually see them turning on and off very quickly. Um, so uh, what else is in there? Um, there's a chapter in there on controlling servos. So usually that's the last thing we do in class when we do this um, and you get to connect a servo and we've got a little robot claw that you can connect that moves back and forth uh, and it looks pretty awesome. Um, and so uh, that is just to show that you can actually do some simple mechanical actuation with the Arduino without needing any transistors or power circuitry or anything like that. You can't go much beyond these small servos though, right? These things are, are tiny and they can move, you know, a very small mechanical arm back and forth, but uh, you wouldn't be able to lift like a, you know, a one kilo weight off the ground with this, right? Um, so if you need to do heavy lifting, like opening windows or something like that, then you need to actually um, work with um, transistors and, and relays and those kinds of things. Um, the, uh, the servo is an interesting thing to try out. Um, if you check out the, uh, the image that is, I think at the very last page of my, my instruction booklet, it shows a little example that I did with my friends when I taught them the Arduino. We just took two servo motors, attached them, attached some legs to them, and then you have got some walking bug robots that you can make walk around um, on the ground, completely self-autonomous, uh, right? Running on, on battery. So um, a couple more words on the Arduino before we wrap this up. The shields, I already mentioned this. These are the boards that you stick on top of your Arduino, and they go on top of this here and basically cover the whole Arduino, bring out all the pins to the top and add functionality. There's tons of them out there, mostly for this uh, Uno uh, shape. That's why the Uno is still um, in, in you know, the default uh, board to work with uh, because you get everything um, designed for it. And there's some pointers to interesting online 
uh, shops and, and, and learning resources if you want to learn more about um, the, the Arduino. Uh, and then that, that wraps up the book um, and this tiny little class. So I hope you got something out of this. I hope you made it to uh, the end of at least the what we covered together, or maybe you got any further. Anybody end up connecting a servo today? Virtually or physically? I'm through with the book. Nice. Yeah, that's what uh, often happens when I do this with computer science students. Um, they just, you know, they rush ahead because they know a lot about the uh, programming stuff already. If you didn't get to it, though, that's perfectly fine. I'm glad that you stuck with us. And um, before you're returning the, um, uh, the kits, then uh, use the opportunity, if you have one, to try to complete the rest of the experiments and play with it a bit um, and, and see what the Arduino can do for you. That concludes today's class and also concludes um, DIS2 as a whole. Thanks, everybody, for um, sticking with the class this semester. Um, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the online teaching format as much as it can be enjoyed. Uh, we do really hope that we can get back into a more personal teaching style next semester. Um, for now, I guess um, I certainly need to wish you all the best for your upcoming exams. And uh, I hope that DIS2 gave you a little bit of a peek, you know, under the hood of how interactive systems are actually working and, and how events travel from, you know, the thing, the mouse under your hand all the way into something happening on screen. Uh, we're continuing with classes next semester. Uh, one thing that you might find interesting is the uh, the iOS class that we're teaching. Um, if you are into mobile application development, if that's something that you would like to understand, that's a pretty hands-on class too. You really dig deep into the iOS frameworks and you learn to become an excellent uh, app developer. But we also talk about mobile app development in general, what it means and how it's different from, from writing desktop apps or web apps. Uh, and of course, if you haven't been to DIS1, uh, if this has been your entry this semester, then for sure, check out our DIS1 class uh, that we have. And of course, we've got practicals and seminars and the likes. And um, if you're interested in a thesis uh, with us, if you're wrapping up your, your uh, studies, then go to the uh, slash jobs page on our uh, homepage. So HCI blah, blah, blah slash jobs um, is the URL to check out for instructions on how to apply for a thesis uh, topic. You can also always shoot Zürgen and Sebastian an email um, to, to make first connections and, and see if they can help you on with something you might be interested in there. Plus, um, we occasionally have Hevi positions uh, too. Not a lot of them, but sometimes we do. Um, again, the slash jobs page tells you how to best get in contact with us um, about these kinds of opportunities. All right, wrapping up, signing off. Um, have a great rest of your day, rest of your week. Um, and good luck with your exam and your further studies. Thanks, everybody. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.